Welcome to this podcast series on The Game Changers, from radical idea to innovative business. Are you wondering how deep tech startups move out of the lab and successfully to market? This series may help to address some of your questions. I am your host, Aoife Mangan, and in this series, I interview technology experts from fascinating industries, including space, energy, health, and quantum. In each episode, we will meet a European Innovation Council, also known as the EIC, program manager, and listen to their experiences scaling up European deep tech. The EIC, in case you haven't heard of it, is Europe's flagship innovation program, supporting university-based tech projects and game-changing tech companies. Today, we're talking about hydrogen, the simplest and most abundant element in the universe and possibly an answer to sustainable energy creation, as in its greenest form, it has near zero greenhouse gas emissions. Hydrogen can give cars a 700 kilometer range on a single tank and power jumbo jets. It could power our homes, factories, cities and energy hungry industries like maritime and aviation. Here to talk to us about the potential of hydrogen energy and the mission of the EIC to identify, develop and scale up Europe's breakthrough technologies is Francesco Matteucci, Program Manager for Advanced Materials for Energy and Environmental Sustainability. Welcome to you, Francesco. Thanks, Ifa. Good morning to all of you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. So, Francesco, you are developing a strategic direction for innovation breakthroughs in the field of materials for energy sustainability, correct? Yeah. No mean feat at all. So in the context of hydrogen technologies, how much progress has Europe made towards the development and scaling up of potentially game-changing innovation? Let me say, Ifa, that uh, I, I'm quite uh, optimistic on, on the overall picture of the r and I'm quite optimistic about the innovation at the low TRL. I'm quite scared about all the wonderful uh, things uh, we have to do. And the issue is that uh, Europe is very good in R&D. Europe is very good in uh, prototyping hydrogen, uh, let me say, economy technologies. But uh, to make it happen, to really use hydrogen as, uh, as the, and the renewable energy vector of the future, a lot has to be done on the, on the regulatory side and on the infrastructure side. Because let me add in one second that hydrogen economy is based on a very long and complicated value chain that means uh, we need to set up wonderful technologies to have hydrogen and these technologies has to use energy and this energy has to be renewable then we have to take care of the logistics of hydrogen that means somehow to to store it where needed to transport it and then we have the different hydrogen uses and each of these three big uh, uh, let me say group of technologies require a long value chain where we have to work all together to make it fast to go to the market. Okay, interesting. And considering the importance of this area, how is the EAC ensuring that Europe supports scientific entrepreneurs to scale up renewable hydrogen technologies? Let me say uh, in, a, in a quite, uh, I hope, easy to understand way, we are working on different, in different ways. The first one is that uh, we set up uh, a Pathfinder challenge. That means uh, as EIC, we have the opportunity to write our own, own work program and to identify challenges. And in this case, in 2021, we wrote the Pathfinder challenge on green or renewable hydrogen production technologies. Pathfinder is very low TRL. These projects, the innovation is that they will work together in what is called the portfolio approach. So trying to maximize their interaction in a what is said cooperative approach. That means cooperative and competitive. So this is the first issue for the very low TRL. The second one is uh, our capability to fund uh, all the projects at different TRLs. That means uh, from very low TRL to high TRL along the what is said the whole innovation journey. And what we do is we fund also uh, small, medium enterprises through the accelerator program. And in this way, we try to work once again content-wise with the projects. So what is the novelty of EIC when working with the different technologies and also obviously with the renewable hydrogen long value chain is really to work hands-on content-wise to work with the project to help them scientifically as well as business-wise. And in doing this, we give them two kinds of support. 
one internal support, an internal know-how that is given by the program manager office, and one help that is given through the business acceleration services. And this help that we provide, both business acceleration and program manager, is, as I said, scientifically, if needed, also, most importantly, maybe innovation-wise, so to help them accelerating, facilitating their market uptake. And in doing this, we help them also to connect with the relevant stakeholders. That is why EIC is cooperating internally of European Commission with the DGs funding hydrogen economy technologies, but also with the Clean Hydrogen Partnership Alliance and with all the other, I mean, uh, let me say, governmental actions that is funding this hydrogen economy. But contemporarily, we also connect with the private stakeholders, our companies of our scientists, because we are really sure that to make this hydrogen economy revolution happen, we need to create ecosystems and we need to help this ecosystem in connecting to increase once again again, the success rate of our different technologies. Fantastic. Thank you, Francesco. And in your role as EIC program manager, you detect trends and identify challenges and bring together and steer projects and companies that can help to overcome these challenges. What should we look out for in this regard when it comes to hydrogen? I mean, if you ask me the, the technologies, it's really difficult to look at the single ones because I may forget something and the priorities are really, again, along the hydrogen production, hydrogen logistics and hydrogen use. But let me say three things that with my colleague, program manager, Marco Antonio Pantale, we put inside our Pathfinder challenge on green hydrogen. It are the following three priorities. We need colleagues to look for the future in setting up hydrogen economy for the future, minimizing the use of critical raw materials or avoiding this. And this is a strong research on the material side and on the technologies of recycling and reuse the critical raw material. The second one is that we need to look at hydrogen economy, as I said before, as part of the big system. So we need to look the picture from the system integration point of view. And last but not least, we are in the 2022 as Europe and as European member states, we need to be the drivers of the circular economy. So once again, we need how to never, as much as possible, never consider something as a waste, but using all the stuff, all the raw materials, all the, all the components, to use them in a second life. And so what is called the circular life thinking. That means we have to start designing the hydrogen economy technologies, considering the possibility to reuse them in a second life or to recycle them once again in a second life. And this is needed because we will see today, we will listen in a few seconds to our wonderful uh, winners of our beneficiaries of EIC, and we will see how much we can really develop the new technologies using light to make hydrogen or using hydrogen inside buildings, using biological ways of making hydrogen. And these technologies are, yes, it is true, not yet in the market, but thanks to EIC and thanks to all the ecosystem, we can bring it as much as possible in a short time to the market. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Francesco. Also with us here today is Indra Neil Sen. Uh, welcome, Indra Neil. Thank you so much. Indra Neil, you have lived and studied across three continents, right? And why did you eventually set up your company, which is a consultancy supporting deep tech companies to scale up here in Europe? And what is your link to hydrogen and the EIC? It's a long story, but the uh, most important point is that, I mean, I cannot imagine such an interdisciplinary and unprecedented idea of ours being supported anywhere else in the world in 2019 and uh, within any other program but the EIC. So, uh, Wasab Innovations, which is the, the company that uh, I had set up, and again, I mentioned it's a long story how it started, but it fitted very well within the the European infrastructure and the, the particularly the EIC. So we went for these EIC calls because we are um, interested in really social impacts. Very good. Thank you, Indrinio. Can you explain a bit more about the use of photochemistry to extract hydrogen, which is the basis of, of your EIC funded innovation? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's for us, it's about soap bubbles. And we find them to be fascinating objects. You know, we borrowed from the architectural principle that is form follows function. And we created a scalable structure with soap foam you know, that can potentially split water 
photocatalytically using sunlight and then separate the hydrogen from the oxygen, which otherwise is you know, uh, an explosive mixture. Now, there are three design innovations here. Uh, the first is the stability of the soap foam. You see, when we think about a robust structure, we generally think of a mountain. That's the human psychology, not a soap bubble. But in our case, we, we needed a structural membrane that would emulate a leaf and that can be scaled up to industrial proportions. And a soap film in this regard is a perfect structure and its temporal nature, when you look from an unconventional perspective, is actually its structural strength as it can be made with minimal energy and for all practical cases is an ageless membrane. Because if it bursts, I mean, so bubble bursts, right? But if, if it bursts, you can make it again easily. We see that a soap bubble, we, see, we look at a soap bubble as a temporary gas compartment and it's made out of a membrane mostly with water and soap molecules. And many bubbles make up a soap foam, which, mind you, is scalable. Just, just look up on the net for the case in the United States where a huge airport hangar was completely filled with flame retardant soap foam within just minutes in a false alarm. And that took months to clear. So it's clear that this is a scalable system. Now, this was the, about the form. The second innovation we have is the function. See, soap molecules are like hair on our skin or like grass on a lawn. And there are a class of molecules that we call surfactants, which are kind of bipolar in character. Like the hair gland that is embedded within our skin, a surfactant molecule has a water-loving head that dips inside the water. And like the hair shaft that sticks up into the air, the surfactant molecule has a water-hating tail that lifts out into the gas phase. Now, there's something really fantastic about these soap molecules. They self-assemble at the water-gas interface in a monolayer. Now, this interfacial monolayer architecture is excellent for efficient transport processes. And chemists have designed and synthesized surfactants for using them as detergents and colloidal stabilizer. But nothing really is stopping us from designing them to function as photocatalysts. And that's exactly what we are trying to do. You know? Make photocatalytic soap molecules. And then we have a third innovation, and that is in the engineering device architecture. Just imagine two cooking pots side by side on two stoves with sunlight providing the energy. In the first pot, water is photocatalytically oxidized into oxygen, protons, and electrons. The oxygen evolves out of the first pot, while the protons and electrons have to be transferred to the second pot, where the protons are then reduced by the electrons to make hydrogen, which then evolves from the second pot. Now, the critical point in this two-step cooking system is that it cannot happen within the same pot, and that the products, the oxygen and the hydrogen, has to be separated. Else we create, as I mentioned before, an explosive mixture. So we have an innovation in the membrane. In our design, we create a desymmetry by using very clever engineering. One side of the membrane oxidizes the water, the other reduces the protons. And this is how we are trying to develop a proof of concept and then create a foundation for scaling it up to industrial scales. Fantastic. That's very exciting, Indranil. Would you mind telling us a bit about how the EIC has supported this NOVA project? Oh, I, I really cannot imagine such an interdisciplinary, unprecedented idea being supported anywhere else in the world in 2019 and within any other program but the EIC. I must say that the program managers, the project offices, the reviewers have been exceptional during this difficult pandemic time. And I, I really thank the EIC coaching supports that and workshops that uh, supported my startup company, Wasab Innovations. And we have definitely benefited immensely. I mean, as a non-European, the overall learning process in this project management has been terrific for me. Fantastic. Also joining us is Rachel Armstrong, a professor of regenerative architecture who combines her academic knowledge and commercial innovation skills to drive two EIC supported ideas using hydrogen as an energy source. Welcome to you, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Rachel, you design and engineer what's known as living technologies. Can you explain a bit about what these are? Living technologies are those that capture the properties of the living world to perform useful work. Um, nature is really creative at finding diverse solutions for 
all kinds of environmental challenges. So rather than copying their forms, as in biomimicry, which has challenges of scale and material selection, we embody biological principles and even biological processes themselves in these technologies. And in this context, microbes are particularly interesting because they're very old biologically and very embedded in the environment. And they've worked with every condition that the planet has to offer in which they've triumphed to survive. And so their legacy embodies the very notion of sustainability. So we can think of microbes, or let us think of microbes, as nature's eco-technology, as through their cell metabolism, they provide a variety of ecosystem services that contribute greatly to the global biogeochemical cycles at the foundations of the biosphere. For example, microbes break down stubborn organic materials, including potentially hazardous environmental pollutants found in common medicines, detergents, and herbicides. But they also recycle nutrients that are vital for healthy life, like carbon and nitrogen, sulfur and phosphorus. So as microbes are environmentally embedded, to work with them as a living technology means that we must embrace their living characteristics by creating environments where they can thrive and carry out their world-making actions. So in this way, we can place biology at the heart of ecological innovation and generate micro factories that are good for the environment. So that's the basis of living technology. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. And links to, linked to this, can you explain the breakthrough solution you were behind that is supported by the EIC, which uses hydrogen as an energy source in buildings? Right. So I am the coordinator of the Living Architecture Project and the Active Living Infrastructure Controlled Environment, or ALICE, Innovation Action. And both of these embody a platform and prototype infrastructure for resource circularity that's powered by microbial actions. So these microbes feed on our liquid wastes, like urine, grey water, and other liquidized organic matter. And they use this feedstock to generate bioelectricity for low power digital devices. And this is shown by the project Alice on using digital screens, using electrons as data, shown as animations. And they can also clean water and generate a range of useful bio, uh, biological substances like nutrients and biomass. So the breakthrough solution that we're developing right now is founded on Alice's living biosynthesis platform. And we're using two particular types of bioreactors. So the first is a microbial fuel cell. We can think of this as a kind of organic battery powered by microbes. It's made up of an anode, just like a conventional chemical battery, that receives organic waste. It's got a cathode, which is a clean chamber that receives the processed materials. And then it has a semi-permeable membrane that provides attachment for an electroactive biofilm that excretes electrons. And these are captured by electrodes. So if we've got our um, electron producing system, the microbial fuel cell, we can pass these then, these this food, if you like, to a microbial electrolysis cell. So the microbial electrolysis cell is configured in just the same way as the microbial fuel cell with two chambers. But rather than making electricity, it consumes it. So the microbial fuel cell is feeding our microbial electrolysis cell. And using these electrons, the microbial electrolysis cell makes hydrogen. And using the electrons, just like Idronil's um, sunlight um, helps hydrogen production, the electrons from the synthesis of new, you know, new substances from organic waste enables us to make hydrogen using in, you know, a, a, a circular biological process. So this means that really, essentially, we can use biological means uh, to create a wide range of renewable biomass and wastewater. So this combination of microbial fuel cells and microbial electrolysis cells comprises a green biological source of hydrogen. And this is important because as hydrogen is the smallest and lightest element, it easily escapes um, its containers. 
And there are fundamental challenges with its storage and containment. So being able to generate hydrogen in a distributed way and generate it at source where it's needed is incredibly useful. So providing a locally available on-demand supply of hydrogen, the microbial fuel cell microbial electrolysis complex, uh, enables us to produce hydrogen, reducing losses through transport and storage. And to answer the question about, you know, the buildings, I mean, how, how, what does this mean actually for, you know, our, the future of our homes? It means that we can use hydrogen instead of natural gas for cooking and heating in our homes, reducing carbon emissions. It means that we actually could have a local infrastructure that produces hydrogen from our waste, therefore reducing our energy bills. And we become producers of energy rather than obligate consumers. And it also means that the hydrogen story can be part of a smart and integrated energy system that can use a range of different sources, depending on cost, depending on availability, a whole range of uh, use parameters. So we could incorporate energy from solar, wind, heat exchange systems, uh, microbial fuel cells, microbial electrolysis cells, et cetera, et cetera, to meet our daily needs. And all of that could be managed by artificial intelligence, which could be powered by microbial fuel cells. And I think this is important because as we're seeing right now, um, this could future-proof us against sudden rises and changes in market prices. It means that we can cut down on the cost of transport and carbon emissions. And it also means that we can offload some of the demands of grid infrastructure. It can make communities more resilient and it can encourage our transition towards low power appliances and the green um, economy. And as we will increasingly innovate technologies um, uh, that uh, make smarter, cleaner use of energy sources, the environmental impacts of our homes will be much improved. And I think when I was listening to Francesco's um, observations about the future of innovation in Europe, I think also when we're using biological organisms as the technology, we can minimize critical raw material use. And particularly when we use uh, microbes in the production of biomaterials, and I think as these evolves, we can reduce, and potentially eliminate them from our infrastructure construction or build the recycling of valuable materials into our expectations of reuse and refurbishment of our home services, utilities and retrofit. And I think it also means that through this um, reconfiguration of consumption within our homes so that we are also producers, we have a new kind of domestic microeconomy as we will make resource through energy provision. We will use less, maybe even no fossil fuels as we metabolize our waste. And I think we might even be able to generate new kinds of circular economies that may be shared between um, communities. Maybe we'll even have a local hydrogen grid or um, we could use various forms of energy for um, exchange within the community or returned to uh, utilities companies, which in my view is less empowering. So I think in terms of uh, the near future, hydrogen in the home is a really smart green choice for energy production. And through you know, cleaning water and you know, reducing solids that are going into our waterways, um, we may be able to go beyond just the impacts of our home and actually have homes and communities that are actually beneficial for the environment and not just uh, you know, uh, net zero, not just neutral, but are actually active actors in the re-enlivening um, of, of our living spaces. So for this, uh, for me, is an important ethical consideration where we're living better with nature through innovation for the future and a legacy um, that really helps us think through biology to generate uh, new energy sources, maybe even a new energy ecosystem, including um, sources of hydrogen, which I think will be at the heart of this. Fantastic, Rachel. So, so lots to be optimistic about here. Do you have any message for projects or companies that are thinking of applying for EIC support? Yeah, so I was listening to Indra Neil's um, uh, celebration of 
the radical interdisciplinarity that enables collaborators from different disciplines to go well beyond their innovation potential. And I think that these new potentialities are activated by dialogue with partners from not just different disciplines, but different cultures. And for me, this is one of the most valuable aspects of the European Union's range of grants. So the you know, EIC gives us access to intercultural exchange. And by working with people from other cultures, with different languages and heritages, something priceless is introduced into the innovation process that can't be replaced with mere money. It's situated within the construction of values and ways through which we can live better together. So I think this is what comes um, with innovating in this way, as we're making meaning and value as well as technology. And I think that's good for people from the outset. Uh, it's good for the economy um, as it gives us ownership of our resources and our world and that the innovation we produce is embedded in how we live and helps us um, work with our communities to engage positively with the kind of change that's necessary to address the damaging impacts of the Anthropocene. So I, I think that the intercultural exchange for me um, is exciting, um, it's enriching personally, but I think also um, it benefits our cultures at a, a time of extreme difficulty and really engages us with positive change. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel. Before we go, I'd like to come back to you, Francesco, for a final word on what's next in this from an EIC perspective. Thanks uh, to, to Indra and to Rachel and to you, Ifa, what is next, uh, in my opinion, is to keep on helping on one side the, the wonderful scientists or entrepreneurial scientists that applies to, to our calls and to work with them to facilitate their innovation journey. And on the other side, uh, we will keep on doing our job to get from them their ideas. So in order to improve our challenges and to spread their ideas where it's relevant to be spread, because we do not have to forget that we also need to train the oncoming world of students that has to become not only wonderful scientists, but let us be ambitious, also scientific entrepreneur. Fantastic. Very inspiring. Well, this is all we have time for here today, folks. Thank you to our incredible panelists, Rachel, Indra, Neil and Francesco, for being with us here today. And indeed, for all the amazing work you are doing in the development of renewable hydrogen technologies. This brings us to the end of our podcast, part of the series, The Game Changers, from radical idea to innovative business. Until next time. <laughs>